Welcome to the December 2022 monthly in-service of the Northwest Kidney Center. As always, I'd like to make a special acknowledgement of the Kent Northwest Kidney Center for providing such exemplary care of our patients and for being a beacon of light uh, during the holiday season as well as every season of the year. You all are amazing and are much appreciated. Now, at the request of Cyrus Christ, who's the medical director of the Port Angeles Northwest Kidney Center Unit, I'd like to acknowledge the contribution of their staff uh, for making dialysis possible for people in that remote uh, corner of the state. Uh, Dr. Chris says uh, you all do a great job and he appreciates you. Uh, today we're going to begin with a clinical presentation of a Northwest Kidney Center dialysis patient known to many of you because of the recent development of an important medical problem. Let's begin. This is an 81-year-old hemodialysis patient, uh, originally from the Philippines, who presented in October 2022 with a mild cough and some left-sided chest pain. Uh, chest radiograph, this is, actual, this is his chest x-ray, it showed a lo loculated left pleural effusion. Uh, a subsequent CT scan confirmed this and also showed nodular opacities in the left upper lobe. So at the beginning of November, the patient underwent a procedure called a thoracentesis in which a needle is inserted through the chest wall to sample some of the fluid at the base of the left lung and a culture was sent. Uh, two weeks later, uh, the patient was uh, admitted to a local hospital because of low-grade fever and confusion. Uh, initially, they thought he might have aspiration pneumonia. They put him on some broad-spectrum antibiotics, and he did not get better. Uh, suddenly, they repeated a CAT scan of his chest, and it showed a more prominent left upper lobe opacity consistent with pneumonia. On December 14th, patient underwent a procedure called a bronchoscopy in which a thin flexible tube is inserted through the mouth um, and down into the lungs to visualize the airways and sample fluid in the lungs. Um, that day, after the procedure was performed, his culture from November 1st, the culture of the fluid at the base of his left lung, was reported to have grown mycobacterium tuberculosis. The patient was started on standard treatment, which includes uh, dexamethasone, ethambutol, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, and rifampin. Um, subsequent hospital course has been notable for the diagnosis of tuberculous meningitis, as well as a lumbar spine TB infection. You can see these well-preserved vertebral bodies here and this vertebral body, which is basically destroyed. With that as background, today we're going to discuss tuberculosis in dialysis patients. It's a particularly important and timely and relevant topic because we see patients with tuberculosis and because tuberculosis is a problem to which dialysis patients are particularly susceptible. Today's talk has three objectives to appreciate the clinical significance of mycobacterium tuberculosis infection in the dialysis population, to recognize the clinical presentation of TB infection both the typical as well as atypical presentation that we often see in dialysis patients. And finally, to be familiar with tuberculosis screening options. Okay, let's begin with the discussion of the epidemiology of mycobacterium tuberculosis infection. Approximately one third of the world's population is infected with tuberculosis. New infections occur at the rate of one per second. It is the number one cause of death in the world from a bacterial infectious disease. In 2014, TB surpassed HIV in number of deaths per year. It caused nearly 25% of the deaths in Europe in the 1700s and 1800s. In 2021, it killed 1.6 million people worldwide. So this is clearly a global healthcare problem of epic proportion. So why are we so concerned about TB in the dialysis world? Well, patients on dialysis are much more prone to develop tuberculosis than the general population. 
In these patients, the diagnosis of TB disease is often difficult because of nonspecific symptoms, so-called atypical presentation, and the prevalence of latent TB infection in dialysis patients is elevated, and those who become infected are at high risk of developing active disease, much higher than the general population. Tuberculosis has been with us since the beginning of time. 500,000 BC first documented ancient case of tuberculosis in the skeletal remains of a Homo erectus skull from Turkey. Infections have also been well documented in Egyptian mummies. Um, about 2,600 years ago in Egypt, a woman named Ertyer Senu died. Uh, she was mummified and buried at the necropolis in Thebes where she remained for over 2,000 years before being unearthed in 1819 and was brought to the British Museum. In 1825, an obstetrician named Dr. Augustus Bozzi Granville declared that he had conducted the first ever post-mortem examination of an ancient Egyptian mummy on this particular woman. Uh, and her organs were surprisingly well preserved. And on her ovary, she had a mass. And so the obstetrician said that she must have died from cancer. Uh, but then subsequent studies revealed that it was just a benign cyst. Then in 2009, researchers from the University College London Center for Infectious Disease and International Health found DNA and cell wall uh, molecules of mycobacterium tuberculosis in several organs, the lung, the gallbladder, her bone, and basically concluded that tuberculosis was the cause of death. So in summary, tuberculosis has been with the human race for a long, long time. In the 1700s and 1800s, tuberculosis was the cause of the white plague in Europe. Uh, nearly 100% of the European population was infected with tuberculosis, and nearly a quarter of all deaths, adult deaths, were caused by tuberculosis. It was called the white plague because affected people looked pale. Now, of course, they didn't have a good understanding of infectious disease at the time, uh, so they didn't know that it was caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis. Uh, people suspected that it was somehow related or associated with vampires. In 1882, the organism was first identified by Dr. Robert Koch in Germany, uh, for which he received the Nobel Prize in 1905. In 1890, he extracted a number of proteins from the cell wall of the bacillus uh, with the intention of maybe making a vaccine, and he thought it might be a curative, but it wasn't. Uh, but his extract was subsequently adapted as a screening test. So that's what we use when we place a PPD or do a tuberculin skin test. In 1906, the BCG vaccine was uh, first developed. That's derived from a weakened strain of MTB. Uh, and its name comes because uh, the extract comes from the bacillus, of uh, the inventors Calme, uh, so Albert Calme and Camille Guerin. So they were the ones who would purify this extract from the weakened strain of TB that we now use as the BCG vaccine. 1921, BCG was first used in humans uh, in France. In 1943, streptomycin was discovered by an American graduate student at Rutgers University, followed by other antibiotics allowing for the possibility of cure for the first time. Many famous people have died from tuberculosis over the centuries. Uh, the author Robert Louis Stevenson, Henry David Thoreau, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, the wife of FDR, Frederick Chopin, the pianist and composer, uh, Saint Therese of, of Lisieux, the little flower, uh, John Calvin, one of the leaders of the Protestant Reformation, uh, Abraham Lincoln's son Tad died from tuberculosis, among scores of others. Let's turn our attention now to the clinical presentation of tuberculosis infection. TB is uh, most often spread through the air uh, when infected patients cough or sneeze. Um, it initially invades the lungs, so the pulmonary alveoli, as the primary site of infection, but then it can spread throughout the blood to more distant sites, lymph nodes, kidneys, brain, bones. This uh, chest x-ray shows uh, pulmonary tuberculosis, 
uh, infection at the top of the lung or the apex of the right lung. And there's a lucency here, which is a cavity. So this is what we call a cavitary TB pneumonia. There are two types of tuberculosis disease, active or symptomatic disease, and latent or dormant infection, which the infection is essentially walled off from the body by the immune system and prevented from causing symptoms. Tuberculosis classically presents as a lung infection. Patients have a vigorous cough, they cough up blood or blood uh, tin sputum, they often have a fever, drenching night sweats, uh, they lose weight, um, it's said that they're that the infection consumes them, so they usually they uh, are all skin and bones at the end. And they also can develop something called clubbing, uh, which is a deformity of the finger or toenails associated with a number of diseases, including uh, various lung infections such as tuberculosis. But sometimes tuberculosis can present with infection outside of the lung. We call this extrapulmonary disease, and this is also known as so-called atypical presentation. Um, the most common forms of presentation are swollen lymph nodes or lymphadenitis. You can also get gastrointestinal involvement. Um, it can go to the kidneys. Uh, it can go to the, the, um, uh, the abdomen, cause peritonitis. It can go to the outside of the lungs, cause a pleural effusion. Of course, patients can have fever of unknown origin. So the atypical presentation is important for us to recognize because this is often how dialysis patients present. Um, extra pulmonary tuberculosis is more common in dialysis patients. Uh, and in some studies, uh, from 60 to 80 percent of dialysis patients with tuberculosis present with the atypical presentation or extra pulmonary disease compared to only about 11.5 percent of the general population. Uh, common symptoms include fever, weight loss, uh, failure to thrive. Um, interestingly, kidney failure, which causes uremia, is commonly associated with fatigue, malnutrition, and other nonspecific complaints, uh, and this has the potential to conceal the course of an underlying tuberculosis infection. So uremia can often mask or conceal symptoms, uh, making uh, the diagnosis difficult. And of course, this can lead to a delay in accurate diagnosis and therapy. Um, and so all of us, particularly uh, those of us who actually directly work with dialysis patients, we should have a high degree of suspicion and consider the possibility of tuberculosis. Um, whenever confronted with you know, a dialysis patient who presents with um, general symptoms such as fever, weight loss, swelling of the lymph nodes, etc. Now the second form of tuberculosis infection uh, that's very important for us to understand in taking care of dialysis patients is latent tuberculosis. So this is an asymptomatic dormant infection. In other words, you inhale the tuberculous bacillus, it spreads to your lungs and potentially around your body, and then your immune system surrounds it and walls it off from the body, essentially keeping the infection in check and preventing the host from having clinically apparent disease. Um, the prevalence of latent tuberculosis in dialysis patients uh, is very high in endemic countries, anywhere from <clears throat> 20 to up to 70 percent. Uh, and those who are infected are at high risk of developing active disease. Um, <clears throat> so here are some examples. In Brazil, the presence of latent TB infection is 22%. In China, it's 30 to 40%. In Taiwan, it's 25%. So this is very significant for us because a large percentage of our dialysis population is composed of immigrants uh, from countries uh, that have <clears throat> uh, uh, endemic tuberculosis. Uh, there are <clears throat> lots of risk factors for latent TB infection, uh, close contacts of people who uh, have had TB, um, foreign-born people from areas that have a high incidence of active tuberculosis, uh, residents and employees of group settings, prisons and nursing homes, uh, and of course, uh, healthcare workers. Now, the clinical significance of latent tuberculosis is that there is a risk of reactivation. In other words, the immune system can wane um, such that it loses the ability to keep the infection in check, uh, and then the infection can flourish and cause clinically significant disease. The risk of reaction, reactivation in the general population is about 10%. Uh, 
but in the dialysis population is 10 to 25 times greater. So dialysis patients have among the highest rates of reactivation tuberculosis of any group. Um, and this is important because if we can diagnose and treat latent tuberculosis before it becomes significant, we can significantly reduce uh, the risk and burden of disease. Uh, in one study, uh, treatment of latent t tuberculosis reduced the risk of tubercul active tuberculosis by 90%. Uh, reactivation disease refers to uh, reactivation of a previously dormant focus uh, of infection seed at the time of the primary infection. Uh, the most common site of reactivation infection is at the top or apex of the lung, resulting in pneumonia uh, and associated pulmonary symptoms, uh, cough, coughing up blood, as well as fever and night sweats. The Centers for Disease Control recommends uh, screening certain populations at high risk for reactivation tuberculosis. These include contacts of people who have had tuberculosis, so say a family member or something like that, people who have HIV infection, uh, patients receiving immunosuppression, uh, organ or hematologic transplant patients, healthcare workers, prisoners, illicit drug users, patients receiving dialysis, immigrants, and individuals in congregate settings. So basically the last three kind of describes the dialysis unit. Risk factors for developing reactivation disease include hemodialysis duration of less than 12 months at a relative risk of 110, so 110 times greater uh, than the general population. A fibrotic lesion, basically scarring on chest x-ray, a positive tuberculin skin test, age greater than 65 years, diabetes, and a low body mass index. So why is tuberculosis so common among dialysis patients, and why is the risk of reactivation so much higher than the general population? Well, there are several hypotheses. The main one is that dialysis patient ha patients have impaired cellular immunity. So basically, there are functional abnormalities of neutrophils, uh, compromised T and B cells, monocytes, and natural killer cells. Um, other comorbid uh, conditions can contribute, such as vitamin D deficiency, that may impair um, monocyte function. Um, a lot of dialysis patients have just a whole bunch of other health problems and use immunosuppressive drugs. And uh, finally, socioeconomic factors. I mean, TB basically spreads more easily among those who live in crowded settings with suboptimal hygiene. So if diagnosing and treating latent tuberculosis can significantly reduce the risk of reactivation disease, particularly in dialysis patients, how do we go about diagnosing our patients with latent TB infection? There are three commonly used approaches uh, to screening for tuberculosis in our population. There's the tuberculin skin test, or TST, also known as the PPD. Uh, we can do a chest x-ray. And finally, we have available to us now these tests called interferon gamma release assays, such as the TB quantiferon gold, and we'll talk about that shortly. Uh, the classic diagnostic tool for latent tuberculosis infection is the tuberculin skin test, or the TST, which is essentially based on a strong cell-mediated immune response induced by uh, latent TB. Um, it is performed uh, by injecting a small amount of purified protein derivative. Uh, that is a crude mixture of more than 200 mycobacterium tuberculosis proteins into the skin. Uh, if someone's previously been exposed to MTB, then they develop what's called a delayed type hypersensitivity response, resulting in induration or swelling of the skin, uh, the diameter of which can be measured 48 to 72 hours after uh, injecting the uh, PPD, the purified protein derivative. Uh, so essentially, the TST measures the body's immune response uh, to those mycobacterial proteins. So how do you interpret the TB skin test? Well, um, in order for it to be a positive reaction, you have to measure uh, 
the diameter of the induration or the swelling. A lot of times people are tempted to measure the redness or the erythema, but you're actually measuring the diameter of the indurated skin. If it's five millimeters or more in a patient with HIV or recent TB contacts or patients who are immunosuppressed, it's considered positive. If it's 10 millimeters or more in a dialysis patient or a recent immigrant or an IV drug user or a kid or someone with a high-risk medical condition or uh, either a resident or employee of a jail or a nursing home or a hospital, it's considered positive. And finally, for patients who have no risk factors for TB at all, uh, in order to have a positive skin test, the diameter of the induration needs to exceed 15 millimeters. So the TST has some important limitations. First of all, it has what we call poor sensitivity. So high-risk patients, such as dialysis patients, often don't mount an immunologic response to the purified protein derivative. And this is called energy. Uh, the prevalence of energy to the TST in the dialysis population is significantly higher than the general population. In one study of dialysis patients diagnosed with active TB, energy to the TST was found in over 50% of the patients. So this means that the test has poor sensitivity. So a negative test does not exclude the possibility of latent or active tuberculosis. Unfortunately, the TST also has poor specificity, so there is a potential for false positives. Um, so, for example, PPD is, um, you know, a culture of many different uh, tubercle uh, bacilli proteins. Uh, and if you've previously received the BCG vaccine, well, you've been administered non-tuberculosis mycobacteria proteins, which uh, some of which are the same as with MTB. So you can actually have a positive test or a false positive test if you've previously received the BCG vaccine. Um, in one study of uh, military personnel returning from missions, about half of the positive TSTs were false positives. Um, now, interpretation of the uh, tuberculin skin test also depends on the patient's risk factor. So recall that induration of 5 millimeters is a positive test for someone with HIV or who is immunosuppressed, but an induration of 10 millimeters uh, is positive for a dialysis patient or a healthcare worker. So you have to interpret the TST in the context of uh, the patient. And finally, there's potential for reader error. So again, we're measuring induration or swelling and not redness or erythema. It's a very common mistake to measure the redness. Another way to screen someone for active pulmonary tuberculosis is to refer them for a chest x-ray or a chest radiograph. Uh, typically, what we're looking for is an apical pneumonia, so a pneumonia at the apex of the lung or the top of the lung. And if you look at this uh, chest x-ray, you can see some dark areas. These are cavities, so tuberculosis is typically a cavitary apical pneumonia. <clears throat> Unfortunately, chest x-rays can also give you false negatives and false positives. So false negative uh, might be someone has you know, active pulmonary tuberculosis, but only, you know, some small scarring or something like that on x-ray that wasn't easy to see. Or a false positive, let's say someone previously had an, a different type of pneumonia, so a non-tuberculous non -tuberculous disease that resulted in scarring in the apex. Um, you wouldn't be able to distinguish active versus, um, versus scarred infection or scarred prior infection. Additionally, one study, there was no correlation between the chest x-ray and the tuberculin skin test. So <clears throat> the two screening uh, tests um, don't, uh, don't correlate well with each other. A much better screening tool for tuberculosis is called the interferon gamma release assay. Uh, these have um, become available in the last uh, couple of decades, uh, and some have been studied in dialysis patients specifically. They rely on the fact that T lymphocytes, so a type of T cell, will release interferon gamma when exposed to specific antigens. Uh, there are currently two interferon gamma release assays available for the diagnosis of tuberculosis. One is called Quantiferin TB Gold, which is licensed in Europe, uh, the US, and Japan and also the T-spot TB, which is uh, licensed in Europe. Uh, they have much better sensitivity and specificity uh, for tuberculosis than the skin test.
So the TB quantiferin gold test, uh, it's a blood test used to diagnose tuberculosis. It was approved by the FDA for use in the United States in 2007. Uh, and it measures cell-mediated immune reactivity to specifically mycobacterium uh, tuberculosis. Uh, so how it's done, basically it uses um, a couple of proteins that are um, encoded by a unique genomic segment um, specific to mycobacterium tuberculosis and not to other forms of mycobacterial infection, so non-tuberculous mycobacteria. Um, and essentially, uh, the lymphocytes are incubated overnight uh, with these proteins, uh, and um, <clears throat> uh, lymphocytes uh, uh, then release interferon gamma, uh, and we can then quantify or we can measure how much interferon that they produce. There are several advantages of the TB quantiferin gold. Uh, it's a one-time blood test. Um, it's less subject to reader bias and error. Um, it has very high specificity and sensitivity. According to the FDA package insert, the specificity is greater than 99% in low-risk people, so a negative test uh, uh, is very good for essentially ruling out uh, latent or active tuberculosis infection. Uh, and the sensitivity uh, is uh, very good. It's 92% in patients with active disease, so it's very good on picking up uh, or right, detecting the presence of tuberculosis. Um, it's preferred TB testing in many patients, uh, particularly those who have been vaccinated uh, with the BCG or those who are unlikely, uh, say, to return for TST reading because, again, you have to interpret the TST, the tuberculin skin test, within 72 hours. Of course, there are some limitations associated with the uh, interferon gamma release assays. Uh, they can't distinguish between latent infection and active tuberculosis disease. Uh, so should definitely not be used as a sole method for diagnosing active TB. Um, you can have a positive test even with a non-tuberculosis non -tuberculosis mycobacteria. Um, and a negative test doesn't completely rule out the possibility of active TB uh, disease. So a number of studies have shown that up to a quarter of patients with active TBA have negative uh, interferon gamma release assay results. Um, and it also doesn't predict which patients with latent TB will develop active disease. Treatment of active tuberculosis infection requires multiple antibiotics over a long period of time, typically supervised uh, by the health department. Uh, and unfortunately, antibiotic resistance is a growing problem in multiple drug-resistant tuberculo tuberculosis infections. We call it MDR-TB. Uh, most cases, cases are in Asia and India. Let's summarize what we've learned today. So latent tuberculosis is much more common in dialysis patients than in the general population. Reactivation tuberculosis occurs 10 to 25 times more often among dialysis patients than in the general population. Typical disease presentation is pneumonia, but atypical disease is extrapulmonary. It can involve lymph nodes, intestines, reproductive organs, the spine, the brain, etc., and is much more common in the dialysis population. The tuberculosis skin test, tuberculin skin test, PBD skin test, has poor sensitivity and specificity for the diagnosis of tuberculosis, as does a chest x-ray. In contrast, a TB quantiferin gold assay uh, has much better sensitivity specificity. It is a preferred test in the future of screening for tuberculosis in dialysis patients. Consider the possibility of tuberculosis whenever confronted with an end-stage renal disease patient who has general symptoms such as fever, weight loss, and failure to thrive. Time for the monthly quiz. Question number one, true or false, tuberculosis is the number one cause of bacterial death in the world. That's true, excellent. Question number two, true or false, dialysis patients are at high risk for reactivation tuberculosis disease. 
That also is true. Excellent. Question number three, the preferred screening test for latent tuberculosis among dialysis patients is... That's right, it's the quantiferin gold assay. Remember that the tuberculin skin test and chest radiograph have poor sensitivity and specificity. Next question, true or false, a negative TB quantiferin gold test virtually eliminates the possibility of latent or active disease. Unfortunately, no test is perfect, and a negative quantiferin gold test does not eliminate the possibility of latent or active disease. You have to have a high uh, index of clinical suspicion for TB infection among dialysis patients, even if the test is negative. Final question, which presentation of TB is more common in dialysis patients? That's right, atypical or extra pulmonary infections are more common in dialysis patients. This concludes the December 2022 holiday edition of the Northwest Kidney Center monthly in-service. Thank you for your attention, uh, and of course, thank you for the wonderful care that you provide our patients. Uh, this is Andy Brokenbro signing out. Until next month, have a happy holiday.